As you consider tech m and it's important to ask who is going to buy my company. There are more buyers than ever and they aren't always easily divisible into the traditional groups of strategic and financial. So let's look at some of the lesser known buyer types including holding companies, sub funds, search funds, family offices, non-tech buyers, and global buyers. Holding companies are long-term hold vehicles that are different from typical private equity in a few key aspects and can be generally categorized into two types, those that emphasize growth and those that prioritize cash flow. They all offer sellers certain advantages that set them apart from the traditional financial buyers. Most notably, holding companies have a permanent investment structure. Unlike typical private equity firms with something like a three to five year hold period, often driven by US tax law around carried interest, holding companies can take a more patient approach. This long-term perspective can be particularly appealing to sellers focused on preserving their company's legacy. It ensures that your company won't undergo repeated cycles of acquisition and divestiture. Furthermore, holding companies usually avoid extensive integration. With no immediate need to see a significant return, there's less incentive to consolidate multiple companies to achieve scale and then sell the whole thing. As a result, the acquired companies can retain their independence and unique strengths while benefiting from the resources of a larger organization. This approach allows your company to maintain your original vision. And another notable advantage of many holding companies is their expertise in M&A. The standout here is Constellation Software, who's actually the most prolific buyer of software companies in the world. Now, not all holding companies operate at that pace. Many do possess a similar proficiency in M&A, leading to shorter due diligence, quicker closings, and reduced deal fatigue. Now, as mentioned, holding companies come in two broad flavors. Some prioritize profitability, seeking to enhance efficiency, maybe raise prices, and then generate cash flow indefinitely going forward. Now, this approach may suit certain companies, though it often does result in less competitive valuations and complex deal structures due to lower post-acquisition growth. I've heard around 2 to 3 percent. Nonetheless, they can be the right buyers, and involving them in a process can apply early pressure if orchestrated correctly because they're very likely to make offers quickly. The other flavor, termed growth hold co's, or at least I call them that, uh, combines a long-term strategy and a decentralized model with a focus on post-acquisition growth. This approach aims to strike a balance between the long-term model and growth equity, which can make it an appealing prospect for founders. Now, the landscape is not strictly binary, as some firms adopt both growth and harvest strategies, and others fall somewhere in that spectrum. Moving on to sub-funds. These entities are subdivisions of larger private equity firms tailored to specific investment criteria. They often target lower middle market companies that fall below the parent fund's investment threshold. Many of them leverage the growth hold coal model as well. One advantage here is their access to the best practices and financial resources of their parent fund just concentrated on smaller companies. Search funds are another intriguing category, where entrepreneurs raise money from investors to identify and acquire a single company, which they then typically run as CEO. This entrepreneurship through acquisition concept actually originated at Stanford Business School and has since really become a global phenomenon. Searchers are often recent MBA graduates and may not possess the technical expertise to run something as complicated as a software company. But many do bring valuable experience to the table. In scenarios where technical founders have established a solid product foundation, Entrusting the company to an energetic, business-savvy CEO could be the perfect match. However, selling to a search fund can entail a dual process. First, you sell the company to the searcher and then to their investors. This can be two rounds of due diligence as well, and he, frankly, even one can be a challenge. Search funds progress through diligence serially as well, minimizing expenses if deal breakers emerge. But this process is ultimately less efficient and can increase the likelihood of complications and retrades. Family offices represent structured funds where high net worth individuals or family members consolidate assets into a collective wealth pool. These funds come in various forms, sometimes managed by family members directly or designated wealth or investment managers. Many smaller private equity firms rely on family offices as their primary investor base, and some family offices establish funds that they control directly. In many cases, the advantage of engaging with family offices lies in their flexibility. Unlike buyers who've raised money with specific narrow investment models, family offices often have the ability to tailor each deal to the unique circumstances, needs, and objectives of the company, its products, and its founders. Non-tech buyers really constitute a distinct category, and they can be challenging to engage with because unlike everyone else we've talked about, the primary purpose is not acquiring tech companies. Tech company valuations can also prove challenging here, but the synergies can yield substantial benefits. This is why you see companies like airlines, retailers, postal systems, banks, insurance brokers, oil companies, and toy manufacturers all buying tech companies recently. 
One of the things we say around Quorum is that every company is a technology company. Some of them just don't know it yet, and some of them are better at it than others. Finally, there is literally a whole world of international buyers as well. While U.S. buyers do dominate, potential acquirers are everywhere, and sometimes the deals go the opposite direction than you'd expect. For instance, Quorum sold WebShare in Silicon Valley to Oxylabs, located in Lithuania. Additionally, we've seen buyers for U.S. tech companies in places like Brazil, Poland, Taiwan, New Zealand, and United Arab Emirates, not to mention the traditional tech hubs across Western Europe, Israel, and East Asia. In fact, U.S. deals involving buyers from outside North America have median disclosed revenue multiples about 40% higher than domestic deals. Outside the U.S., selling cross-border is even more common, especially if you properly manage a broad global process. It's actually unusual here at Quorum for a company outside the U.S. to sell within the same country. There are just so many more buyers out there. And that's what I hope you take away from all of this. If you've built a successful software or related technology business, the world of buyers is probably larger than you had realized.